Welcome to the Business of Biotech Summer Executive Sessions, where we sit down for timely, informative, and personal conversations with the people who are driving biologic therapy innovation. I'm Matt Piller, Chief Editor at Bioprocess Online, and today's show is about ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, and we're hosting a true authority on the subject in Dr. Loretta Etri, CMO at Immunomedics. Now, this show normally focuses on uh, preclinical and, and clinical stage companies, but we're making a bit of an exception here because bending the rules a bit because uh, Dr. Eatry's company just uh, recently in May of this year went commercial with uh, its triple negative breast cancer therapy, Trodelvi. So first of all, uh, Dr. Eatry, congratulations on that. Thank you, man. Yeah. Now for, uh, for a little bit of background on you, for our audience, I, I want to let everyone know that Dr. Eatry uh, became involved uh, with Immunomedics back in 2019, which was a critical point in the pre-commercial activity taking place at the company. Um, and when she signed on, uh, she signed on in February of this year as CMO, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And, and, and when she did such, she brought more than 40 years experience uh, in clinical and regulatory affairs leadership at a few shops that you've probably heard of, including Hoffman LaRoche, J&J, Genta, and the medicine company. So plenty of, uh, plenty of good experience with some big pharma companies there. Um, so again, Dr. Ichi, welcome to the show. It's, a, it's an honor to have you. Thank you, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to get to know you before we get into the, the conversation around ADCs and some of the therapies in, in the works. Uh, and, and again, as I said, now, now commercial at Immunomedics. I want to get to know you a little bit more. Um, and we'll start with a basic question. When and why, uh, I mean, you've, you've had a, a long and, uh, and um, I guess, uh, well, uh, a well-deserved long-running career, but, but let's back way up and, and, uh, and, and determine, uh, tell our audience when and why you decided that you wanted to get into medicine. Um, well, it goes way, way, way back. Uh, I think I was probably five years old when I announced that I was going to be a doctor. Wow. And uh, <laughs> that's probably not a surprise because medicine was the only profession I knew about. My father was a general practitioner in Brooklyn before it was trendy. Mm -hmm. And um, his office was in the ground floor of our house. My mother was his nurse. And uh, I frequently got to open the door when people couldn't get into the office. They'd come around the other side of the house. So I got to see a lot of pathology at an early age. Um, I used to also go on house calls with my father back when doctors made house calls. So for me, it was, um, it was just a natural evolution. It was what I wanted to do from the beginning. And... Um, it's what I ended up doing, and I've been never sorry with that decision. Yeah, that's a cool story. It was kind of uh, almost written in the stars or, or prearranged based on your upbringing. Did you have Did you have siblings at all? I had an older brother. I uh, have an older brother. Uh, mm -hmm. He was the one who was supposed to be the doctor. Small Italian family. Girls weren't supposed to do much of anything back then. Right. Uh, but at any rate, that's the way it worked out. Yeah, so he's my he's brother not in, is not a doctor. <laughs> not in not in medicine, huh? No. Very cool. Uh, in the early days of your career, you were spent uh, in in clinical and uh, R and D regulatory affairs roles. Um, again, with with big pharma, as we ascertained. How did uh, how did those early experiences sort of shape the course of your career? Well, actually, um, to be completely honest, it started earlier than that. Okay. Um, I did my fellowship at Sloan Kettering in New York, and um, I had the opportunity there to become involved um, in the development of the, the first drug that was actually an effective agent for the treatment of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, metoclopramide. Um, this, is, this is sort of ancient history, but back in those days, platinum uh, was a, a brand new major drug that had very important um, clinical activity, but we were limited 
by the very severe nausea and vomiting it caused. And so um, I spent a lot of time um, doing some unpleasant things <laughs> to um, document the activity of this drug. But long story short, metoclopramide got approved on the basis of the work that I did. And it was that bug that bit me and made me realize that by doing drug development, I could probably help a whole lot more people than by doing one-on-one -on -one bedside care. And so it was really that experience that drove me to find a career in industry. Um, and so I wandered across the river to Hoffman LaRoche. I lived in Manhattan and of course in those days, New Jersey was where all of the drug companies were. And I joined Hoffman LaRoche as a research physician. Um, at Roche, I had wonderful opportunities. It was a great time to be in industry. It was just about the time that biotech was um, exploding. Um, I had the opportunity to run um, not just research, but I was transferred for a while to run the safety group. I learned um, a whole lot about pharmacovigilance, um, managing different groups of people with different mindsets. I was then transferred to run the phase one unit. I learned a lot about pharmacology, um, early clinical trial work. Um, so um, I spent about 10 years at Roche and um, I became very rounded. It was also at Roche where I expanded from oncology into additional um, therapeutic areas, virology, um, and of course, AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma was a big problem then. AIDS in, had exploded. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I, got, I got to um, really grow very significantly. So we always used to say that Roche was a great place to be from. Then I was recruited to J&J. &J. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, that's that's fascinating, and I guess I should uh, just stop and thank you for your work on on it's metoclopramide. It's no surprise that you would uh, get get bit bitten by the bug when you achieve and, and experience success that early in your career, and that's become uh, I mean as standard uh, a, a drug as as there is I think you know for for its for its indication. So um, really cool. I didn't know that about you, but now I'm even more honored to be speaking with you now. Well, it was a team of people. It wasn't just me. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So you, you've been in CMO roles now for the, for the past several years. And how would you say that uh, your, your clinical and regulatory experience have sort of shaped and prepared you for uh, the, the chief medical officer position? Um, Well, it's uh, how do I explain this? It's sort of that everything that you learn um, along the way, um, the management of diverse uh, therapeutic areas, the understanding of what are the critical um, concerns of people in different units, what are the safety people concerned about? Uh, what are the folks in pharmacology thinking about? Um, what are the statisticians worrying about? Um, how do you link to the commercial folks? Um, how do you keep senior management happy? Um, mm. How do you deliver on a timeline? The importance of project management and of course, above all, regulatory, always with the idea that everything you do it is in the context of a regulated environment, always making sure that everything you do um, conforms um, with quality and regulatory needs. So I think that there were uh, just a, an, a whole variety of experiences that prepared me uh, for being a CMO, but I think the single most important was um, my oncology training, mm -hmm. um, caring in the end for what happens to the end user who is the patient, having sat at the bedside and understanding that everything the organization underneath me does is in the service of the patient. 
Um, that has always kept me centered and directed and helped me to um, make decisions um, that were appropriate and um, proper uh, for, for the industry that we are in. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you about that focus on oncology throughout, uh, throughout your career. Like you said, I mean, you're, it's your, your interest is, uh, your interests and your experience are, are wide and, and variable, but there's a co that common thread of oncology. And I want, I was, I was curious, and I think you, you may have just alluded to the answer. I was curious whether that was sort of by, by choice or by chance or just by, you know, virtue of, of market demand. But it sounds to me like there's a, a fair bit of choice in there. Well, I actually don't believe that very much happens by chance, just as a, as a rule. But, um, you know, oncology was my first love. Um, intellectually, um, I think emotionally as well. Um, oncology has always felt like the place where I belong most. Mm -hmm. um, that is not to say that I um, don't think that there is huge value huge value um, in having been able to touch multiple therapeutic areas. I learned so much developing antibiotics. You know, no patient receives chemotherapy without getting an infection. Understanding that part of it, very, very important. Um, and so the Although I always somehow manage to come back to oncology, I do it almost unconsciously mm. because it is the thing I love to do most. But um, not for a second have I regretted my work in AIDS, um, my work uh, in s some of the neurologic diseases. Um, all of those have somehow taught me something different that has helped me um, in the next phase of my career. Yeah, very cool. So I want to, uh, I want to sh shift into uh, the work at, at Immunomedics, and I think a good place to start there would be to kind of discuss how you, how you became involved uh, in the Trodelvi project and then uh, eventually accepted the CMO role there. So you were involved in the project back in 2019, but not in a official kind of uh, hired capacity. Is that correct? That's very correct. Yeah, yeah I, I, I keep, this is like my third attempt at retiring. I am, <laughs> I stink at retiring. <laughs> I'm just not good at it. Um, so the way I, I ended up at Immunomedics was uh, a friend who was working here called me and said um, that there was a position um, opening, a CMO position, and um, he thought that I could really help. And so I came by for an interview. Um, and of course I did my homework. I can't help it, I always do my homework. And uh, I was already kind of fascinated by this molecule. I knew a couple of things, mostly that it was um, a really uh, good treatment for a bad form of breast cancer. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of knew. I also knew that it had been um, already submitted to the agency and the agency apparently thought that the data were good enough um, for the drug to ultimately be approved, but there were issues with manufacturing. Been there, seen that before, thought, I know how to do this. Let me go and see what's happening there and if I can help. So I came in and um, this was hot on the heels of um, the departure of the former CMO. And I met with the people um, and I talked to several of the management folks here. And um, it didn't take long at all. I'd say within a week, I was up to my eyeballs, jumped in with both feet, um, making decisions, uh, figuring out what needed to be done, uh, working with every level in the organization, and uh, up to my eyeballs in Intradelvi and um, loving every minute of it. Um, you know, when you're used to, to running 
organizations like this, especially when there's a goal so close at hand, I, you know, it is just, um, um, it, it's so seductive, uh, for me at least. I Probably other people it wouldn't be, but for me, um, I just couldn't resist jumping in and um, helping to pull um, this important drug across the finish line. It was just, it was as if I was meant to do it. Yeah, and that, that hadn't, that hadn't happened yet uh, when you came on as CMO, but the writing was pretty much on the wall. Um, well, yeah, I, you know, but I, I read Invisible Ink, so yeah. <laughs> the Business of Biotech is produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva. If you're the leader of an early to clinical stage biotech, you need to check out the resources that are hand curated for people like you at CitivaLifeSciences.com backslash Emerging Biotech. The Knowledge Center there is chock full of articles, webinars, videos, podcasts, and other content that's ultra focused on helping new and emerging biotechs chart the course to the clinic and beyond. Check it out, CitivaLifeSciences.com backslash Emerging Biotech. You know, the, the seductive part that you mentioned, uh, certainly you're no stranger to approvals. You know, I mean, I, like I said, I, I learned moments ago that uh, you were involved in, uh, in, in the approval of metoclopramide. And since that time and all your experience with uh, large pharma companies, I'm sure you've experienced several approvals, but this one's got to be uh, different. It's got to feel different. It's a first time with a, you know, a much smaller company. Uh, you played a, a key role in helping the helping the drug cross the finish line. Just give us some, you know, maybe a little inspiration for our new and emerging biopharma audience about what that feels like. Uh, in a word, it feels great. <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, it, it, I think I I lost track. I think this may be my 17th or 18th uh, drug approval. But wow. you're very correct. Um, this was really special. And what made it special, um, well, there's a couple of things. First of all, there was an absolute roller coaster ride that this company went through. The ups, the downs, the almost getting there, then having it taken away, and then fighting back up to the top. It, it was incredible. Um, and the people who lived through that were equally incredible for their dedication. One of the things that, and this, this comes back to the issue of working in oncology, the people who work in oncology, I think are very special. The dedication of the workforce here was just remarkable. Um, they had been beaten up, uh, but they never gave up on this drug because they knew it was important. And I will share with you um, that one of the most difficult things that, that we went through here was um, our inability to make the drug available to patients in need. We were getting phone calls from um, family members and, and patients themselves, you know, begging us for the drug because there was no good alternative. And having to turn those people down uh, just weighed so heavily on everyone who worked here um, that on the day, April 22nd, when this approval came through, we were working remotely, but I'm telling you that you could hear the corks popping through the phone. The, the, the just unbridled joy of now being able to say yes. Yeah. All of those people was, it was extraordinary. Yeah, that is extraordinary. Um, and I want to give you an opportunity to talk about why, why just, you know, why, why the therapy is, is special um, and give us some perspective on, I guess I, I'd start with, uh, you know, what, what innovations have, have brought, uh, uh, I guess, the rise, brought about the rise of ADCs and then kind of transition from there into what differentiates, what makes Tradelvi uh, special compared to the, uh, the, the other ADC approaches on, this, on the market today? Okay, well, um, you, this is indeed the era of, of ADCs. And um, 
ADCs, for, for anyone who doesn't know what that means, are antibody drug conjugates. And the name ADC actually very well characterizes what they are. They are antibodies um, that have a chemotherapeutic drug, also known as a payload, um, attached by a linker. And the antibody portion of the drug specifically targets the antigen on the surface of a tumor. It's rather like a targeted missile. You can think about that. Um, but although it sounds, um, it sounds simple and intuitive almost, um, it's actually a very complex science. Uh, and it has been, this whole uh, concept of ADCs has been in development for more than 30 years, I would say. Mm -hmm. 1960s is when it started. So, um, I, I, if, if it's okay with you, I'll just talk a little bit about the details of ADCs. Would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, yeah, there, for sure. Okay. So, there are three pieces, as I've just described, to an ADC. Now, each of the pieces has a challenge of all of its own. So the antibody piece needs a target antigen. Now the target antigen needs to be specific to the tumor and not expressed in normal tissue. And the reason for that is you want to avoid the attacking, antibody going uh, to the normal, normal tissue, tissue and causing sure. toxicity, right? Okay. So the other thing that, that we need is that the antigen needs to be on the cell surface so that it is, um, it's available to the circulating ADC. Okay, that way um, the ADC can attach to the antigen and then get internalized into the, the middle of the cell where it can release its payload, okay? So, then we have the middle piece called the linker. And the linker also has a couple of special things about it. The linker needs to be stable enough that it doesn't release its payload into the bloodstream because the payload causes lots of damage if it gets loose. So it also needs to be designed such that it can release its payload in the, at the proper time once it's internalized into the cell. So there's a lot of chemistry involved there. For most of the available ADCs, that uncoupling inside the cell requires an enzymatic cleavage, okay? Mm -hmm. Just to make sure it doesn't come off early. So then we get to the payload, which is the drug portion of the conjugate. Now, what we've learned over time is that the payload needs to be potent enough to kill the tumor cell. The early ADCs actually tried to use standard chemotherapeutic agents, the stuff that we use systemically, and they just didn't work. They were not potent enough, and there, there's just many examples of failed experiments. So then that ushered in an era of using extremely potent um, payloads uh, attached to the ADC. And that also had problems because um, sometimes there was very ser serious toxicity, including fatalities. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it was a problem. Now, the payload also has to be able to cross the cell membrane, because once it dissociates, it will kill the cancer cell. But you want for the payload to be able to get out and kill other surrounding cells. Uh, you wouldn't want just one cell. So, but that means that I have to teach you about something else, which is called the bystander effect. Hmm. So, it is known that most tumors, which are conglomerates of cells, are heterogeneous in terms of their expression of cell surface antigens. So while a tumor may have cells that express your target antigen, 
there's likely to also be a lot of cells in that tumor that don't. So what you want is for the internalized payload to get back out so that it can kill these other non-antigen expressing cells, they're bystander cells, okay? So mm -hmm. it's bystander killing. So as you can imagine, each one of these three components um, is a science project unto itself. Um, right. So you can imagine that having to create the appropriate science that leads to the appropriate combination um, could take a really long time. And that explains the 30 years to get where we are today. And we now have about five approved ADCs um, commercially available and approved. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, uh, do you teach as well, Dr. Eatry? Are you a teacher? I, I used to teach a medical student. Yes, well, I, if uh, that, that should be a job that you have a hard time retiring from because you do <laughs> you do an excellent job uh, at, at that. It's a great explanation. Um, so, and I think you in that explanation, I think you started to maybe hint a little bit at what makes Trodelvi different. Uh, so maybe you can expand on that a little bit. What it what it is that uh, you know kind of helps Trodelvi make that leap from thirty year you know th the thirty year beginnings to where we are now. Okay. Well. Um... Trudelvi, as I said to you, um, the more I read about it, the more fascinated I became. So what makes it different? Well, first, it's got a great target. Um, trope 2 um, is a, it's a cell surface antigen that is overexpressed in many solid tumors, but its expression is very limited in normal tissue. So that's thing one, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, second, the payload of Tradelvi is an agent called SN38, which you don't need to remember, but instead of being extremely toxic, I would characterize it as moderately toxic. Um, and in fact, it is the active metabolite of a drug that we use commonly in the clinic systemically, Ireno TCAN, but it is um, significantly more potent than Ireno TCAN. But the good thing is that we know what the side effects are. Mm -hmm. So it causes diarrhea and neutropenia, which, you know, in, in my world of oncology are side effects that are equal, easily manageable. Um, we right know how to deal with them. It's not, it's not um, anything that's, that's frightening. Now, because of the relatively better tolerability of the payload, we can give Tridelvi at higher doses. Now, why is that important? Because the higher the dose, the greater the ability of the ADC to penetrate deeper into the tumor and thereby kill more tumor cells. Additionally, the molecule of Tridelvi is able to carry approximately twice the amount of payload that other ADCs do. Hmm. So it can get deeper into the tumor and it can release more payload molecules. So those are two big things. But the biggest thing, and we have, we have a joke around here, we always say the magic is in the linker. Mm -hmm. um, we've, got, we've got a really interesting linker. So remember that I told you that linkers have to be stable because you don't want them releasing their payload inappropriately. Well, our linker is moderately stable. So it's stable enough that it doesn't release its payload into the bloodstream, but it also doesn't require enzymatic cleavage to break apart. Now, why is that important? Now, remember that I told you that once an ADC is internalized into the cell, for most of them, 
enzymatic cleavage is required. But Tridelvi can get both into the cell, but because of the relatively unstable linker, it can undergo hydrolysis in the tumor microenvironment. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that Tridelvi doesn't actually need to get into the cell to work. It can actually release its payload before it's internalized. Hmm. So it can kill a lot more bystander cells than ordinary ADCs. So it kills bystander cells by two mechanisms. So when you put all of that together, it's sort of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's just right. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that, that's fascinating. I'm I'm uh, I'm interested in uh, you know you've you've talked about the the lengthy multi multi year progression of of ADC development across the board, um, and, and and the differentiators between traditional ADCs and Tradelvi. What uh, what, what can, can you kind of highlight a, a specific challenge, production or process manufacturing challenge or two that uh, Immunomedics faced and was able to overcome along the way? You alluded earlier to the ups and the downs and just the the stick to itiveness of your of your team. There uh, was some of that process and manufacturing uh, oriented. Um, well, I I would say that um, there were challenges everywhere. Yeah, And they weren't limited to manufacturing, although we did have manufacturing challenges, quality challenges. Um, I am probably most familiar with uh, the clinical challenges. And to be, to be fair, I, you know, I don't think that they, the challenges we faced really were different than any other biotech that is transitioning to a commercial entity. So we didn't have enough funding, staffing, processes, or technology. Um, so take your pick. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's pretty classic. So um, a couple of things that, that um, I think are important is that, you know, we have to remember that the original clinical trials that um, form the basis for the accelerated approval actually started in 2012. So on the clinical side, we actually were still dealing with paper case report forms, um, uh, unsophisticated database and analysis tools. Um, so we, we were dealing with a lot, but we were definitely not state of the art. Um, yeah. So to overcome these obstacles, we, we really focused on um, rapid improvement in three areas. We, had to get some better people. We had to fix our processes and we had to upgrade our technology. And we focused initially on recruiting a very experienced um, industry trained talent. Um, we made sure that anybody who joined was a roll up your sleeves type person. This was, you know, this anyone from big industry who thought they were going to have handmaidens was not in the right place. Yeah. Um, so this was definitely a roll up your sleeves kind of, um, kind of mentality. And people had to be imaginative. We, we redesigned our most critical business processes. We, we focused necessarily on our clinical operations, data sciences, uh, we upgraded our safety reporting, uh, regulatory, um, and all of these things served to simplify um, uh, our clinical operations. They reduced our internal risk, and they strengthened our inspection readiness, which, of course, uh, we knew was coming. Yeah. So um, I think that today, as as I think of my organization, it's, it's a totally different place. It isn't perfect. Uh, I don't think it will ever be perfect, but we're definitely working to a high industry standard. Um, and I think more importantly for me, 
is that the culture we have developed through all of this is certainly resilient. Um, we communicate openly and we solve problems mutually. Um, so I'm very proud of the team that we've built here and uh, the enormous amount that we were able to accomplish in a very short period of time. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all that success. It's an, an inspiring story. Um, and I'm, I'm, we're, we're sort of running up against our time allotment here, Dr. Etri, but I, I do want to ask you this. You, uh, you, you, you took on the, the CMO role to take this product across the finish line. You told me earlier that you've tried to retire multiple times, but you failed at that. Uh, now you've achieved this success with this particular drug for this particular indication. I know that Immunomedics has more in the pipeline, more indications for Trodelvi, more into, you know, more more uh, uh, therapies in development. Does does Dr. Etri stay on and 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 fight for those, or does Dr. Etri say, "Hey, I'm going to go out on top. This is number 17, 18, whatever number it is. We're gonna we're gonna go ahead and uh, hit the beach." No, I'm 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 here for the duration. Um, I've got to see this through. Uh, yeah. This is the tip of the iceberg. Um, as you may know, we just reported the confirmatory results from the ASCENT study. Um, I couldn't possibly leave with results like that. So yeah. no, I will see. I will see it through. Um, so tell me, tell me how your. Uh, so, so we've ascertained that you're you're sticking around. Tell me how your role changes. Just just briefly, how how the CMO role changes from you know, push it across the finish line mode uh, to, okay, it's across the finish line, there's more work to be done. H how, does, how does that just change your day to day? Well, I think um, it takes some of the pressure off, okay? Um, so you can breathe, um, but really not much more changes because we have a whole series of clinical trials um, ongoing, actually several that are near to reporting out. So that part of my job remains unchanged. What's different, um, and, and um, I have lived through this uh, on more than one occasion, is, is when a product becomes commercialized, a whole other series of events happen. And um, we've always had, for instance, I've had reporting to me a, a medical affairs group but suddenly medical affairs is taking a whole lot more of my time. Mm -hmm. um, promotional review, um, the uh, training of the MSL team, um, uh, the uh, grants process. So the attention that now needs to be paid to um, what was sort of a slower, sleepier portion of the organization um, has now woken up like a dragon and is growling for attention. Um, so I'm having to more or less divide myself um, across the spectrum. Yeah, that's uh, that's it's, it's a fascinating uh, response because I think it's very instructive. You know, for for folks who who haven't seen that transition and might not know what that entails. So thank you. I, I want to give you an opportunity before we close to uh, share any concluding thoughts or words of wisdom or inspiration for, uh, for emerging biopharma companies, the, the leaders of those companies. Um, or, or any other concluder that crosses your mind, Dr. Eichi, anything, <laughs> anything you wanna close with? Yeah, I, I have, I, you've made me think about this and um, I, I, I can't really say I have a word of wisdom, but I do have an observation um, and and I think it's worth sharing because it's important. Um, I would say that in this experience and in many others, what I have learned in a leadership position is that the single most important thing that I do is make decisions. And by that, I mean the following. Nothing will destroy an organization more quickly than a leader who can't make a decision. And you must come to terms with the fact that you're never gonna have 100% of what you need or want to know. 
But if you get 90% of it, which typically you can get if you've got good people and you trust them, you've got to trust yourself because you've ended up in the position you're in largely because you've done well. Trust your instincts, take the risk. 90% of the time, you're going to be right just on the basis of your experience and your gut. Mm -hmm. And if you screw up, you have a chance to fix it most of the time. So I would just urge people to make those decisions. Uh, it's worked for me, at least. Dr. Utri, it's, uh, it's been an honor talking with you. I think this has been an informative and, uh, and fun conversation to have, and I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Hey, that's Dr. Loretta Etri. I'm Matt Piller, and this is The Business of Biotech, produced by Bioprocess Online and graciously sponsored by Cytiva. Access more resources for emerging biotech at cytivalifesciences.com backslash emerging biotech. And in the meantime, subscribe to this podcast, give us five stars, and uh, visit bioprocessonline.com to subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.